In addition to the obesity epidemic plaguing uh, the U.S., we also have a STI epidemic as well. To provide us an update on uh, STD treatment, it's a pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Richard Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a clinical professor of family medicine at UCLA, and he will be presenting the topic STD Update 2015. Rich? Thanks, Marty. The uh, first slide sort of is a uh, representation of where we've come and where we're going and how things have changed. Um, for those of you that are my vintage, STDs used to be a, a disease where we used a microscope to make a diagnosis. And uh, most of you now probably don't even have a microscope in your office and you use more sophisticated testing such as you know, DNA amplification tests and we used to uh, use a lot of intramuscular injections uh, for STDs. Some of you remember the old aqu aqueous procaine penicillin, one shot on each side, you know, and the patient would run out of your office with leaks coming out of the gluteal area. That sort of gave way to uh, oral antibiotics, but interestingly enough, we're moving back to injectables, as you'll see in the case of, of gonorrhea. So uh, things come and things go. I'm going to spend the next half hour really just talking about chlamydia, gonorrhea, talk a little bit about STD screening and what your role would be as primary care physicians, and then finish up a little bit on herpes simplex. The whole area of STI is a huge subject, but these are the common conditions that most of you deal with in your office. Now, chlamydia is um, really the most common STI uh, with a the overall prevalence is not very high, 200 per 100,000, which is only two-tenths of 1%. But in some uh, socioeconomic and age groups, it's as high as 20%. So it varies a lot by who you're taking care of. That collectively comes to about 4 million cases. And again, the complications of chlamydia are primarily pelvic inflammatory disease in women. Uh, and a newborn infection for a, a baby that's born through an infected uh, chlamydia birth canal. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind and, and why the screening paradigm makes a little bit of sense with chlamydia is that chlamydia is, is really um, a dormant condition for most people. In other words, the presence of chlamydia doesn't produce symptoms in that many people. So it's not uh, always symptomatic which makes sense for screening. And just to refresh your, your memory a little bit on chlamydia, it's kind of a funny bacteria. It's classified as a bacteria because it has enough organelles to be a bacteria, but it really can't reproduce on its own. It doesn't have the reproductive machinery to reproduce itself without invading a human cell and using some of the additional organelles that's in the cell. So here you see what happens, a chlamydia organism gets inside of an epithelial cell. It uses some of the epithelial cell reproductive machinery to reproduce itself, you know, RNA and uh, ribosomes, et cetera, and ultimately reproduces itself and then comes out of the cell in much multiplied form. And that takes about 72 hours. So chlamydia has to live inside of a human cell. That's the only way it can reproduce. And that has some role in how you detect it. Here's the prevalence curve. And this middle line is the 200 per 100,000 roughly. It's actually going up a little higher. But note that um, women have about a threefold prevalence increase over men. And you may ask, well, why is that? It's a disease that's really pretty much shared equally. Um, and it goes back to thinking about how the organism gets into your body. It needs an epithelial cell to live in. And the female genital, genital tract has more easily accessible epithelial cells than the, than the male does. So Females tend to acquire the disease um, at a higher likelihood, which is a bit unfortunate because females also are the ones that bear the brunt with respect to pelvic inflammatory disease uh, in terms of the long-term consequences. And here you can see this is uh, on the, your left is, is males and on the right is females and then going down are age bands. And this is important because you can see most chlamydia is in this 
really 15 to 25 group, maybe extending out to 30. And again, you see the threefold difference between uh, females and males, and that has some implication in terms of how you approach screening in, in these types of patients. So a little more women than men. There are uh, socioeconomic and gender and racial differences uh, and ethnicity differences between uh, prevalences of chlamydia, as you can see here. So again, that's a factor when you choose how you may manage your own patient population. If you have an ethnic or racial population that has higher prevalence, then obviously the, you know, the, the, the economies and the rationale for screening make more sense than if you have a population that's really low in prevalence. Not only do we vary by the factors I just mentioned, there's also some variation geographically. And this is a, a slide of the incidence per 100,000 of chlamydia across the United States. And interestingly here, I, California and Nevada, we're about equal, so we, nobody can claim victory there. If you want to escape chlamydia, you really have to go up to the northeast, up there in Maine and, and Vermont. But, you know, you're not out of the woods up there because you can get Lyme disease you go up there, so you're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, you're right. It isn't, you're, it, isn't, it isn't really as true as, as it's said to be. But notice here, this is Washington, D.C. A, a thousand cases per, per hundred thousand. So why is that? <laughs> I'll let you conjure up the answer to that. But it goes along with my notion that not a whole lot good comes out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, how do you detect uh, chlamydia? That historically, you had to grow these on tissue culture. Um, because as I said before, this is not an organism like a beta hemolytic strep where you can put it on blood auger and it'll just grow and reproduce itself. You had to tissue culture it like a virus. And that was a complicated process and it wasn't terribly accurate, but that had been the gold standard. Uh, now basically everybody uses one of these DNA amplification tests and the, the idea there is that a small strand of DNA is isolated and then it's amplified up to maybe 10 to the fourth or 10,000 times as much and then the probe is run against it and you can detect it. But well, they're very, very accurate. Um, and there's a lot of different eponyms that go along with different methods but they're all basically doing the same thing. Um, the, the advantage of of that is that it's actually more accurate than the tissue culture method. The tissue culture method had problems because it was a complicated process. So it's probably 20% more accurate when you compare it with cultures. Um, in males, all you need is a urine sample. You don't have to do a urethral swab, which makes screening easy. And in females, um, you can do it from pelvic collection on a cervical or vaginal discharge. Again, a urine sample is fine. And you can also do it on thin prep pap smears. They can run the DNA testing on that. So just by doing a pap smear, you can use that as a screening method if that's indeed uh, what you've done. A couple points on the urine screening. The, people sometimes confuse the notion of first voided urine, meaning it has to be the first urine that you void in the morning when you wake up. Um, first voided urine just means the first 10 mils of urine that come from the urethra. So again, these organisms grow in these epithelial cells. So if you think about it, it, as you start to void, it's more likely that epithelial cells are passed in the first urine that goes. So that's the reason that uh, that's the recommendation in terms of how you collect that, which is different than the way some of your medical assistants or nurses uh, would collect a urine for culture where you want to avoid the contaminants, so you, want, you do a midstream collection. So this is a first void urine. It doesn't mean that you have to wait and only get the urine in the morning. So it just means first void. Uh, some people get confused on that. You don't have to have a live organism. So all you need is a piece of DNA. So it could have been there and it could be killed, but if the DNA is there, it'll still come back positive. And most of these DNA tests will remain positive for up to three weeks after successful treatment. So if you're doing test of cures, which we'll talk a little bit about, bear in mind that if, it come, if, you, if you test too soon, it's not a meaningful test, okay? And that can create a lot of confusion with people. So the tests are very good, but they stay positive longer than what you would think. There's a few other older methods I won't get into. Basically, none of these are terribly helpful. Um, 
Interestingly, as primary care physicians, particularly with women now, um, you guys are doing a good job in terms of detecting it, and this is just the source. So this is, primary, this is office based medicine here, the blue bar on the left. And uh, a high percentage now of chlamydia positives come from physicians' offices and less so from STDs. Men maybe haven't quite caught up. They still tend to use STD clinics uh, a little bit more often than women. But, so that's, that's actually kind of helpful. Historically, when it came to treating cervicitis or chlamydia, <laughs> we used to gram stain the cervical discharge. And if you found gram-negative intracellular diplococci, in other words, there was the presence of gonococcus, you treated for both organisms. Nowadays, that's pretty much given way to, you treat based upon uh, your DNA probe. So if someone comes in and has a positive chlamydia and a negative gonorrhea, they don't need to be treated for gonorrhea and vice versa. It turns out the gonorrhea treatment is now inclusive of chlamydia, not for that reason, but for other reasons, as you'll see. Um, the recommended treatment is really quite easy for chlamydia, and you can either use azithromycin in a one gram dose, which is easy, or you can use doxycycline uh, twice a day for seven days. Those are over 95% effective, according to the CDC. Those are recommended treatments. Alternative regimens are erythromycin. And interestingly, this is one organism where there's a difference in quinolone susceptibility. I don't see quinolones having a big role in treating STIs because there's issues with quinolones in pregnancy, there's issues with quinolones in youth. And you know, you're, you're in a population where there's a fair amount of youth and a fair amount of pregnancy. But if you do use quinolones for chlamydia, it's only these two, ofloxacin and levofloxacin, that are recommended to treat uh, chlamydia. Uh, norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin have less uh, activity against chlamydia, interestingly enough. So if you're, if you're into quinolones, just remember those two for STIs. In pregnancy, you obviously can't use a quinolone or tetracycline, and it's recommended that the azithromycin or even amoxicillin can be used. Now, what about test of cure? How many of you will do a test of cure uh, in, with chlamydia? Just raise your hands. Yeah, some of you do. Um, it's actually not recommended by the CDC if you use one of the uh, recommended regimens, okay? If symptoms persist, it's a consideration. It's recommended in pregnancy, and there's a CDC recommend, recommendation for retesting, or actually it's rescreening women who are infected with chlamydia, and that's not because of a higher failure rate with a recommended treatment. It's because of the curves I showed you in terms of prevalence and youth, and that a woman who's infected with chlamydia has a fairly high likelihood of reinfection with chlamydia on the basis of uh, her greater susceptibility to infection. So that's the current thought of that. But if you do want to do a test of cure, remember you better wait at least three or four weeks out if you're using DNA amplification methods. This is an important aspect of trying to deal with this disease, and that's how do you treat the partners. And that had always been a difficult issue because, uh, again, many partners aren't accessible to you when you see the patient. Uh, the current recommendations are that you should treat all partners within two months, or if there hasn't been a partner within two months, the most recent partner. That's the current recommendations. How do you do that? Well, they have these eponyms called ex expedited partner treatment or patient-delivered partner therapy. And that is an issue that sort of bounces around your medical board and your pharmacy boards that, are, that govern the practice of medicine in each state. Now, some states, and the ones you see here in white, and both you guys in Nevada and us in California are enlightened enough to allow this, uh, what some states don't, um, and this is a little old, so some of it's changing, but this is basically statutory permission for you as a treating physician to circumvent that notion of a physician-patient relationship in order to treat an individual. So you can write a prescription for a patient you have not seen and not examined for, in the case of chlamydia. And this is the key word in the statute. This was passed in, nine, in 2001, actually, in California for chlamydia. And it says, may dispense treatment for chlamydia to a patient for use by the partner without prior partner examination. Okay, that's the statutory language. 
ostensibly gives you permission from the, the, the uh, in, in our case, the California legislature. Now, if the partner dies of anaphylaxis, uh, will you be sued? Yes, I can guarantee you. Will you win? I can't guarantee that. But I'll bring this to court to testify on your behalf. Uh, you know, that's another bugaboo we deal, we deal with. So just to finish up on uh, azithromycin, it, one gram is, a, is the dose approved for single dose for treating chlamydia. The reason it's, it, it, it's a good drug for chlamydia is it has a very long half-life and it has high tissue penetration, okay? That's why it works for chlamydia. It's a category B drug for pregnancy, and actually at two grams, uh, orally, it is also FDA approved for treatment of gonorrhea, so it has some potential there as well. Moving on to gonorrhea, uh, this one has no gender prevalence. It uh, pretty much equally infects males and females, and again, this is an organism more like a beta streptococcus. It just lives on tissue. It doesn't require intracellular uh, cohabitation, so to speak, to reproduce, and the rates have been about the same, running about half to a fourth as much as chlamydia. Um, again, this was an organism we used to culture. It didn't like to grow in room air. It used to have to grow under carbon dioxide on this Thayer Martin uh, uh, culture media. And that kind of fell by the wayside, except till recently, there's, the gonococcus has undergone a lot of mutations and antibiotic resistant development. So now we're starting to get into the era of cephalosporin resistant gonococcus. And the issue of cultures is coming back into play because um, from a public health standpoint, people have to culture the organism to actually determine its antibiotic resistant levels. That information is not really available in terms of DNA screening at the present time. Perhaps it will be. So there's a little more um, use for culturing gonorrhea now because of this issue, but that's fairly recent. Um, and again, everything I said about nucleic acid amplification methods for gonorrhea, is, for chlamydia, is true for gonorrhea. Um, it's the same tests. Uh, male, again, doesn't have to have a, a swab. Uh, you can use all the same issues. Um, just one comment about some of the nucleic acid amplification methods you will see. You, you will have some, depending upon what your office uses, where it'll say it's not FDA approved for a certain source. That is primarily the manufacturer simply hasn't spent the money to get that approved. But for, for all practical purposes, all of these are probably equal across the different specimen sources. But some have spent more time to get you know, an indication from the FDA, but they work. And this just shows the rising rate of, of cephalosporin resistance, uh, as you see here, we're getting up. And actually now in California, it's out to about over 5% of, of um, gonococcus is resistant to cephalosporins in the doses that people got when they took oral suffixime, okay? And so that's why you'll see that the recommendations have changed. And that was in 2012. Um, prior to 2012, the recommendation was simply 400 milligrams of oral suffixime. But as it turns out, the tissue levels of suffixime are not high enough to kill some of the gonococci. So now we've gone back to a recommendation of using an intramuscular cephalosporin, in this case ceftriaxone, at a dose of 250 milligrams, plus another antibiotic, and as you notice, these are the same treatments that I listed for chlamydia, and this is not there because of the potential cohabitation of gonorrhea and chlamydia. It's felt that by doing a combined antibiotic treatment, it will lower the rate of further gonococcal resistance. It's kind of like the approach that you see for tuberculosis therapy, where while the organism may be susceptible to one drug, the public health department will recommend two or three drugs so that you don't uh, foster the development of, anti of further antibiotic resistant tuberculosis, or in this case, uh, gonococcus. So now we're back to an injection plus an oral medication or the recommended treatments. If for some reason you do not do the injection, um, an alternative regimen is going back to the 400 milligrams of oral suffixime in a single dose plus these other two agents, again, to present 
to prevent the development of resistance. If you use one of these alternative regimens, it's now recommended that you do do a test of cure because there is this potential for a 5 to 10 percent perhaps miss rate, particularly in the western states. Um, and so that's changed a lot where uh, if you went back five years ago, it was fine just to use oral suffixing and uh, with no test of cure. So now it's become a little more complicated for GC. So that's something you should take home from here, and we'll, we'll finish on that too. Uh, azithromycin is another alternative regimen, again, taken at two grams and a test of cure with that as well. And that's just a slide that this is looking at quinolone resistance, and this happened quite a while ago, and this is why quinolones uh, are really not recommended anymore for gonococcus. The, the gonococcus, if you really go back in time, the gonococcus, as I mentioned in the opening, was treated with two shots of penicillin. Then it became resistant to penicillin. Then all of a sudden the quinolones came along. It was a great drug for gonococcus. It was uniformly sensitive to it. And then what happened uh, starting in Hawaii and then moving on to California, everything that's bad, I guess, starts and moves east out here. But, uh, uh, it, you know, it's so highly prevalent now that it's not a recommended treatment. Uh, and that stopped in 2007. There's no recommended treatment for quinolones in gonococcus because of this resistance. So in pregnancy, um, you know, you, you have to use one of the cephalosporin regimens or azithromycin. And again, a test of cure. You can't use the doxycycline uh, co-treatment in pregnancy, obviously. Um, Test of cures in gonorrhea. This used to be no, but that's changed. And so if you use the recommended regimen, the intramuscular ceftriaxone plus one of the other co-treatments, um, you're fine to not do a test of cure because that's highly likely to be effective. But if you use one of the alternative regimens, then you want to do a test of cure. Again, if it's nucleic acid amplification, you're going to wait at least three, three weeks. If the patient's pregnant, you want to do a test of cure or if symptoms persist. And again, treating sex partners for gonorrhea, it's exactly the same. All partners within uh, two months or the last partner. Can you give it to the, par the patient's partner? The answer to that is yes. And it's interesting, this didn't happen until 2007 in California, whereas the chlamydia treatment was 2001. Um, tells you something about how legislatures operate. Um, but again, it's the exact same permission. It says, uh, may dispense treatment for gonorrhea to a patient for use by the partner without prior partner examination. I know that's the same in Nevada, too. You have exactly that wording. So just to finish up a little bit on suffixime, um, it is an oral cephalosporin that is less effective uh, than against penicillin and quinolone-resistant gonococci than IM ceftriaxone, okay? And that's because of tissue levels, all right? A single dose of cefixime in the 400 milligram dose requires a test of cure. And it is not effective against chlamydia, and it's really not recommended at all for oral pharyngeal gonorrhea. So that's changed a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about screening. Um, if you go back and look at those prevalence slides and the fact that you're dealing with largely an asymptomatic illness, um, those are the kinds of issues that make screening have a reasonable rationale for doing. If you've got something that the person doesn't know they have, if it's left undetected, there's some probability of having a reasonable amount of morbidity. Um, and you can do something about it. Well, that's the kind of thing that we screen for. I mean, that's the reason people screen for colon cancer or why we screen for breast cancer, because it's something that people don't know they have. You find it, you can do something about it, and you have a better outcome. And so with, with this group, the screening is really quite easy. As we talked about, all it really requires is a urine sample um, or perhaps a pap smear. And so the burden really ought to be on why you shouldn't screen, because it makes a lot of sense. And the, the drugs that we talked about here, cefixime, azithromycin, and even potentially uh, intramuscular ceftriaxone, are drugs that all of you use, um, you know, with a fair amount of frequency for conditions that probably don't have as much merit as STDs do. I mean, most of you probably, if I asked in the last week, have you given out a Z-pack for somebody with a cough? 
Most of you wouldn't raise your hand, but I know that you all have. Uh, <laughs> your practice is no different than mine. I have to. But think of all the chlamydia you've treated out there, uh, <laughs> particularly if you live in Washington, D.C. So it, screening makes sense, okay? And again, it's because in women untreated, about 40% will go on to pelvic inflammatory disease, and then you tend to have a really large group of fairly serious uh, consequences in women. The current recommendations, the current Center for Disease Control recommendations on screening um, are really that we should screen all women for chlamydia under age 25 and older women with risk factors such as listed here with multiple sex partners or a new sex partner. For males, and again remember males were only prevalent at about one third the ratio so that the, the algebra doesn't work out quite as good for males. Uh, many people will screen males, but the CDC recommends targeted screening for males. In other words, those males who have some of these risk factors. Um, and again, this is easily done. All it requires is to pee in a cup and put the first pee in the cup. Uh, it's pretty easy. And, and a lot of you, uh, uh, you know, of my vintage, and you have adolescents in your office, and you know, you're a little uncomfortable about how do I deal with this issue? They're in there for a volleyball pre-participation exam, or they're in there for golf pre-participation pre exam, or something like that, or they're in there for a sore throat. You know, the easiest way to deal with the adolescent group, um, I've found, is you just ask them, do you need an STD screen? They'll tell you yes or no. They don't even ask what it is. They know what it is. You know, they know more about sex than we do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's kind of eye-opening, you know? Oh, yeah, no, I just had one two months ago. I'm up to date on that, you know? Uh, <laughs> Oh, wow, okay. And uh, so, you know, you can, be for, you can be forthright with most of those. Now, the other issue that will happen in your practice is that those of you that have, you know, uh, sustained private practices with patients and families that you've followed for a long time, there obviously are adolescents that just don't fit the high-risk group. Now, your insurance company may come around and grade you on, uh, you know, what is your chlamydia screening rate in your adolescent females. And, you know, you're either in the good book or the bad book, depending upon your ratio. Um, I think there, again, uh, I believe in common sense and, and that if you know your patients well, and they obviously come from a low-risk group. Now, you can argue maybe I don't know what their sexual practices are, but some of you do with patients that you know. So I think you have to kind of take these CDC recommendations that are then reinforced by insurers and government agencies that come out to grade you to some extent with, um, you got to use your head too, because God did give you a brain. So, uh, you know, if it's not really required or it's going to be a highly disruptive issue to even get into with a patient because you can see it doesn't make sense, I think there's some validity to, again, using uh, your brain uh, over and above all CDC recommendations. But in case you're tested, uh, this is what you need to know. It's easy to do. You don't have to do a pelvic exam. Um, and as you know now, you know, the, the early, the recommendations for first pap smear screenings are put off, a little bit delayed to 21 or after three years of sexual intercourse. So again, the urine sample makes it easy. The girl doesn't have to fear the pelvic exam. But always remember these things. It's youth, sexual activity, and a prior history of STD. Those are the things that you kind of want to focus on uh, when you look at screening. Um, for gonorrhea, uh, again, you saw the prevalence rate was lower. So again, the math doesn't work out quite as, as well. The CDC recommends targeted screening for women um, and targeted screening for men. So again, you have to kind of put that into those factors that we've talked about. That's why I spent some time talking on prevalence, ethnicity, gender issues, even geographic differences. Um, it was interesting on that Washington, D.C. slide, they didn't localize in Washington, D.C. I wonder if it was closer to the Capitol or the White House or <laughs> issues there. But uh, <laughs> again, same issue with gonorrhea. And here's uh, the distribution of gonorrhea. Again, Nevada and California were about equal. If you want to get away from gonorrhea, you know, you can go up Montana, Idaho, or you, again, you can go up to the nice northeast. But if you see here and you want to get to where it is, you go back to the capital. Okay? A couple things that come up in screening, and, and this is what are often on your patients' minds more. People want to be screened for 
HPV, they've watched Dr. Oz, they've, they've found out about HPV, or they found out about you know, the dreaded herpes. Um, really, the screening math doesn't make sense for these diseases. HPV is very prevalent. Almost everybody has some component of DNA of some component of papillomavirus. And there's really not a big issue with morbidity with papillomavirus. I mean, there's a little bit in terms of some of the serious complications, but not very much. Again, as we'll see in a second, uh, about a fifth to a fourth of the population is infected with herpes simplex type 2. Most of them are asymptomatic. So, and it doesn't produce any real long-term consequence, and you really can't treat it. In other words, it's with you. So what's the role for screening with it? People will come in, and they, they want to be screened for this, and sometimes you just can't argue them out of it. You know, they just have to have the test done. I mean, well, you know, okay, fine. But it's not going to be terribly helpful. Does screening make sense? And, and the real, the first test of this was published almost 20 years ago, um, by uh, Scholes in Seattle, and this was the Group Health Center, which was one of the first HMOs in Seattle, and they had many women, they were on recalls to just come in and get annual pap smears. And they had a group, and they randomized them, and they did annual pap smears, and at that time, they were only doing chlamydia cultures, and they, they did STD cultures on one group and just pap smears on the other group, as well as pap smears on the, on the incident group as well and then treated those that came back positive, and they found about a 50% reduction in PID in one year. And this was doing the culture methods, not the more accurate amplification methods. So there was pretty good data to suggest that screening and treating actually does produce what we, we think it does. There's some more recent data that has probably, has called that into question to some extent, and it may not have as big an impact as we think, but I still think that the data is persuasive enough that you know, a screening and treatment paradigm makes sense in these populations that are at risk. And lastly, I'll just finish up a little bit on herpes. Uh, this is one of the most misunderstood diseases out there, and this part of the talk, I, I kind of call it the herpes hysteria talk. So it's, the, the idea here is to give you some ammunition to help your patients resolve what is largely more of a psychological problem uh, or a fear problem. And about a fifth, or a little bit more than a fifth, of the United States population is infected with herpes 2. Uh, and most of herpes 2 affects the genital area. Uh, and this is going up in time. Now, of that fifth, which is about 20%, only one-fifth of that, so a fifth of a fifth is one-twenty-fifth, or 4%, only 4% only of patients actually report any symptoms. So, 80% of people that have herpes 2 have no symptoms. They don't get recurrent ulcers. They have no symptoms whatsoever. It's an asymptomatic infection. Um, and that's why there's not a big rationale for screening for something that's prevalent in that high a number. And this is all the total population here. And here's age. You can see by age 70, it's over a quarter percent. And again, there are some uh, racial and ethnic differences as well. Um, but nonetheless, it, you know, it, it causes a lot of office visits, a lot of phone calls. Um, it's really poorly understood. For some patients, it's very psychologically troubling. Um, the only real serious problems with herpes are really in two conditions. If you have an individual who's immunocompromised, for example, somebody who's on chemotherapy for lymphoma or something like that, and they get a an outbreak that disseminates, that can be severe. The other group that suffers is that situation where a mother, a pregnant mother, is seronegative for herpes 2 and acquires herpes the first time in the third trimester of pregnancy. That's the infant that's at risk for neonatal herpes, okay? And that's a pretty rare issue, but that gets into the whole issue of obstetrical management of herpes. So again, not very many patients that have problems with herpes in a serious mortality or morbidity issue, it's more psychological. Now, how do we get herpes? And that's, that's because it sheds. If you take the 20% of the population that has HSV by antibodies, they have IgG antibodies to type 2, and you take the, the 8 tenths of that, the 16% the or the 16 of those, if you have 20 here that have it, you take 16 that never have any disease, they've never had any ulcers, they've never had anything, and you swab their perineum, 
they will shed the herpes virus on about 5%. Here it says 3 to 10%, about 5% of days, okay? So 16% of the population out here sheds herpes 5% of the days. How does herpes spread? Not too hard to figure out. Now, the 4% that have active lesions, if you swab their perineums, they shed at exactly the same rate. So basically 20% of the population, uh, roughly, sheds herpes virus on 5% 5, 5 of the days a year. That's just, that's just the facts of how we live. Um, now, if, if you have people who have active outbreaks and they have active lesions and they're early on in that lesion process, you can recover virus at a high prevalence in that. But, but people don't tend to have perineal contact or sexual contact during active outbreaks. People think, I'm going to avoid that because I don't want to spread herpes. But it turns out most herpes is spread by asymptomatic contact and asymptomatic acquisition. So that's why we're seeing more and more of it. And if you just plug in all those numbers and you look at people who have uh, normal sexual activity where one partner is positive for HSV2 and the other partner is negative for HSV2, the seroconversion rate is about 5 to 10 percent per year. And that's, that has to do with, with acquisition rates and frequency of, of uh, an infective process. Now, we know that if you suppress the infected person with long-term acyclovir, you can lower the rate of viral shedding. That's been shown. So the next question was, if we can lower the rate of viral shedding, if we treat with long-term suppression people who are IgG positive for HSV2, can we lower that 5% transmission rate that occurs in the non-infected individual? And that's kind of a hard study to do, but a, a, a multi-country study was done by Corey, published in the New England Journal about a decade ago, where it looked at this, and this took about 1,500 discordant couples. In other words, one of the couple was IgG positive and one was negative, and they followed them uh, they randomized them, and then in, in the treatment group, the positive partner got oral acyclovir every day. They took 500 milligrams of Valtrex every day. Um, they were counseled about condoms. They, had, they came in monthly. All of their sexual activity was recorded. Their symptoms were recorded, and they had their serologies checked every month, so you could see what the conversion rate was in patients. Most of these patients were... Uh, HSV1 positive, which is fairly highly prevalent, maybe 60 to 70 percent. And if you see here, this was an eight-month period. The placebo group, they had, they were, the average coital acts were 49 versus 46, about the same in eight months. Notice the range. Those of you can do the math. <laughs> well, some of you aren't products of the new math, I can see. You can at least divide. Um, what happened? Well, they showed that you could indeed reduce the rate of transmission. And they reduced the rate in symptomatic patients by about a factor of four, and in people who just acquired the disease by a factor of two. So the risk ratio went from one to 0.5, um, you know, which sounded pretty exciting. But <coughs> given the amount of data they had, you could actually work the numbers back. And from that, you could you could get to this number. And I think this is the most important number in terms of helping you deal with your patients. And this is the number of, of what is the likelihood in a, of, of one coital act being the, that a person will acquire herpes if they are antibiotic negative and have a coital act with an antibody positive individual, okay? And these were the kinds of numbers they've got. And so in the treatment group, for females, they acquired it at 0.6 per 100 per thousand. In the non-treatment group, this is just everyday population, it was one, a little over one per thousand. And for men, it's about three, three times less likely to get. Again, it's kind of like chlamydia. So what can you take home from this? Well, it means that obviously, you know, the probability of getting herpes in a coital act in discordant individuals is pretty low. So when you have the patient that comes in that's all freaked out and they say, oh, you know, I had sex with somebody and now they called me and they told me they have herpes. And the, well, you can sort of say, well, you know, if it's a woman, it's about one in a thousand. If it's a guy, it's about one in 3,000. That's kind of reassuring to people. Um, 
that you have those numbers. Now, again, these numbers look low, but if you have sexual activity over a period of a year, you know, it gets up to that 5% transmission rate that you're going to have if you just, if you just kind of multiply out uh, the frequency of coital acts. So that, that I think, I, I took away as the most helpful thing. Um, I won't talk about HSV-1. Uh, again, that's very prevalent. causes labial herpes. It can cause genital herpes. It's a little less severe, lower recurrence rates. How do you diagnose herpes? It's still really a clinical diagnosis. Um, and there are many clinical manifestations listed here. Uh, it can be the classic, you know, a little itching, tingling, burning pain, and then it breaks down from a pustule to a little ulcer, and then re-epithelializes re over. That's nice. It can present as dysuria. It can sometimes be systemic symptoms. Sometimes it can be just a little area that seems like trauma. Uh, you can get little fissures. Again, it, as I said, you know, the bulk of this disease is asymptomatic, so why would there be a classic presentation? Obviously, those people that have symptoms are more on one end of the spectrum where their immunology allows this infection to occur because 8 out of 10 people have no symptoms. Um, you can culture. It, the, the, still, the state of the art is to do a tissue culture, because again, this is a virus, so it has to grow on tissue culture, on very early outbreak lesions. Again, it, you have to get them really at the vesicular stage, because that's when virus is there. Once it's scabbed over and started to keratinize, your culture is really not going to be very effective. Um, there are preliminary, there are nucleic acid methods now coming available for herpes, but they're not widely used. Uh, and so you, you're probably still going to use cultures if indeed you feel the need to do this. Um, should you treat these people well? Um, somebody who has the first episode of symptomatic herpes, treatment is fairly effective. As you can see here, it reduces uh, the pain by up to three days and then it makes the healing quicker. And there's a, a variety of, of acyclovir-like agents you can use. There's no data that says any one a cyclovir treatment, whether it's famvir, whether it's val valcyclovir, or whether it's a cyclovir, is any better than the other. They're all equally effective. <clears throat> Some of them have a little different dosing schemes, as you can see here. Most of your office-based herpes deals with people who have recurrent outbreaks. And the data here is discordant with what your patients tell you. Um, I mean, there are patients that tell you, I take my a cyclovir cream. I put cream on at the, at the beginning of an outbreak and it always stops it. Or I, if I take my acyclovir, it just stops it like that. It's hard to support that with data. And most data, if you use large trials, you know, you, you get less than a day of improvement versus non-treatment. Um, but again, are you going to sit there and argue with your patient about the data versus the patient? Probably not. Um, you're dealing with a fairly benign treatment and your time is limited. And uh, recurrent treatments, again, multiple different acyclovir regimens. The cheapest one is probably this one here, uh, where you just use uh, 800 milligrams of acyclovir three times a day for two days. Um, there's a bunch of over-the-counter stuff. Pencyclovir probably you won't even see anymore. That was a treatment used for, uh, for uh, herpes that wasn't very effective. At the checkout counter at your Ralph's stores, you'll see these little, the Consonol cream, it's called a Breva, 10%. Some people use these. The data on that, and this is from the manufacturer, that you know their, their data went from 4.8 to 4.1 days, and that's manufacturer data, probably not terribly effective. But again, nothing is probably terribly effective. I think from the psychology of treating patients, what patients need is control. You know, everybody likes control, whether it's a cyclovir cream, whether it's a cyclovir aura, whether it's a Breva, they want to do something. And so, you know, that's an option out there, but it probably doesn't cause any problem. The real area where you may use uh, a cyclovir agent that means the most is that small group of people that have debilitating, frequent, recurrent herpes outbreaks. That group, suppression, clearly reduces the frequency of recurrence. But it doesn't alter the natural history of HSV. And most HSV tends to have less frequent outbreaks and less severe outbreaks as time goes on. So if you're going to suppress people, which means taking a daily agent, um, it's recommended that some interval, maybe a year, a year and a half, you go ahead and stop and see whether they come back with treatable-like frequency or severity symptoms 
uh, because it may very well be that the natural history of their herpes has subsided and you can now go ahead and, and not have to give them daily suppressive therapy. I won't talk about pregnancy. It's a complicated issue where it's driven by the litigation climate, not by data. Nothing new there. Uh, take home messages, GC and chlamydia, pretty prevalent inhabitants in sexually active individuals. It's easy for you to confirm. The DNA probing and testing is very accurate. The burden of proof and non-treatment is really on you uh, and screening makes sense. Partner treatment is easy to do and you're protected. Gonorrhea drug resistance is continuing to increase and probably will. Quinolone resistance for gonorrhea has reached the point where quinolone treatment is no longer recommended by the CDC and single dose oral cefexime is no longer the recommended treatment for gonorrhea. You have to add an intramuscular uh, ceftriaxone and an additional uh, co-treatment to prevent uh, mutations. Most of HSV2 is subclinical. Suppression for HSV2 can reduce recurrences, and suppression for HSV2 can reduce transmission uh, to uninfected HSV partners, but the clinical relevance there, I would, uh, I don't really think is established unless you're the manufacturer of the cyclovir. And with that, I'll thank you. We take some questions for Dr. Johnson. Uh, we'll bring the microphones up and... Do you diagnose oral pharyngeal gonorrhea with a urine test? No. <laughs> so then you Not do... unless they have a very confused anatomy. <laughs> so how do you, what do you do, a throat culture? Yeah, you can use amplification methods on a throat swab, obviously, yeah. I have never... this gentleman here, he had a question. Female patient, oh sorry, a busy urgent care setting, female patient will come in with, uh, with uh, some symptoms and will have a clean catch UA collected. In that case, I've had them self-swab uh, for the GC chlamydia and gotten pretty good results with that. Right. But rather than using the clean catch UA. They, sw they send a swab themselves. Yeah, I have them self-swab. Yeah, no, I mean, that's an acceptable way to do it. Uh, you know, but with, th was this in males? No, no, not with the males, I'm talking females. Females, yeah, no, that's, that's an that. acceptable way to do it. I mean, that's been used for HPV as well, for looking for high-risk HPV in some areas where, you know, pap smears aren't as available. Actually, it's interestingly, in England, um, they've tried to get at this issue with uh, the young active group with mail-in urines, where people collect urines at home and mail them in. I, I've never screened for uh, herpes. Um, but after listening to your lecture and, and hearing that 5% annual transmission rate, uh, you know, you multiply that out by a, by a few years, um, the number starts to get up there, and it may, may lead you to believe that maybe you should be screening these asymptomatic patients, because after a few years, the transmission rate starts to get high. That's a correct analysis of the mathematics, but I would ask you, how are you going to deal with the issue with this monogamous couple? You've screened them, You're newly kidding. married, one's positive and one's negative. Advocate uh, condom use. Right, but the condom use, it's perineal spreading. Condom use doesn't reduce the risk very much. That's what was presented in the data. You could put the positive partner on some acyclovir agent for the rest of their life, and you would lower that mathematical calculation by upwards of a number of four. Um, but bear in mind, you're trying to prevent, and this was the point I'm trying to make, you're trying to prevent a disease that eight out of 10 have no symptoms. So, you know, is it a lot to do about nothing? And I think that kind of depends upon your point of view on, on that. Just one really quick question. Um, you said it can be gonorrhea or chlamydia can be up to three weeks in a test of cure sort of sample, but how long do you actually advise the patients not to have unprotected intercourse after they've been treated, you know, in clinic or, you know, for the diseases? Yeah, the oh. CD, his question was, uh, when is it safe to resume sex if you have one of the recommended treatments? And the CDC answer to that is seven days. 
Um, I see kind of a younger popul population, and so where oral sex is very prevalent, and yet I see a ton of genital herpes because of the sexual practices. Any recommendations in terms of suppression in patients that routinely practice oral sex, sexual practices? Uh, I, I, can you repeat that? I didn't quite get the gist of the... Um, lot, young people with a lot of sexual activity. Like oral sex is what right. they, they practice, and yet I see a lot of genital herpes. It's HSV-1 now. Right. But what about recommendations for... You can tell a teen and a college kid not to do it. They're just going to do it anyway. When they, and then the shedding, do you then suppress them so they don't then give it to multiple partners? Well, I don't think there's any data on, uh, on suppression of the transmission of HSV-1, okay, labial herpes. Bear in mind, though, that HSV-1 is very prevalent. And if you do HSV-1 antibody testing, um, you know, by age 20, it may be, it may be 50 to 80 percent. Uh, her question is, if somebody you think is a newly diagnosed genital HSV-1 that was the result of a recent oral sexual activity, would you suppress that patient to treat, to potentially lower their rate of transmissibility to others? I think, is that the question? Well, that's the same question that really you deal with anybody who, who is positive for HSV-1. Does it make sense to suppress a positive individual. That person is probably going to shed HSV-1 perineally in that 5% range or 5% of days, just as if there were HSV-2. Um, so, you know, I think it comes back to that same question. Is it, does it make sense to put basically 25% of the world, the United States population on daily, daily drugs? I mean, that's the essence of that question. And, you know, I, I would question the, the, the worthwhileness of that. Again, psychologically, there may be people where it matters. Two more. Two more. Two more. Um, when would you actually place um, uh, symptomatic patients um, as far as suppressive uh, therapy for genital herpes? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the first part. Um, you know, patients who are basically um, having recurrent um, genital herpes, when do you actually recommend, like, uh, suppressive therapy? Would, would you actually oh, recommend? Oh, I think that's a discussion between you and the patient. I mean, for some people, twice a year is a crisis. That's a two-day illness. And for other people, they just seem to have less sensitivity. So I, I don't think you can put any clear numbers on, you know, X number of outbreaks per unit of time. It really depends upon the relationship and how the patient feels about it. And as we all know, I mean, some people are just petrified of herpes. You know, in that case, you know, my threshold to suppress would be certainly different than somebody who's not. But I would make it on the basis of the person's symptoms and their, their feeling about it. I wouldn't make it on the basis of this notion of suppressing infectivity to others. Last question. I just wanted to know the uh, incidence of neonatal herpes transmission over an active lesion during a vaginal delivery. Do you have that information? <laughs> like, well, that's a very hard, hard issue to get at. And um, I can't tell you the, the prevalence. I mean, people will list rates of, you know, one in 10 per thousand of those. But then the whole issue comes up, does suppression, does treating it make any difference? Does even C-sections make any difference? And it turns out it probably doesn't if you look at the data. But you take that data to court and somebody brings in a neonatal infected kid with herpes, good luck. Okay. Um, thank you.